Welcome from me, Nick Gowing, to the BBC World Debate from Burma. Until a few years ago, protesting monks and anti-government activists were routinely rounded up on these streets. Now the military rulers have authorised political and economic reforms few ever believed were possible. Opposition leader Aung San Suu Kyi is now in Parliament after two decades in prison or under house arrest. Civil society has come out of the shadows. Most international sanctions have been lifted. Investors are flocking here. But what new Burma is emerging? Will a genuine pluralist democracy develop in time for the presidential election two years from now with a vibrant economy to rival Asian neighbours? Can violent ethnic conflicts be resolved to create a stable, united and peaceful nation? That is the world debate. Burma, what future? Well, you join us at the World Economic Forum in Nepidor, which is the capital of Burma. It's the first gathering of international business and political leaders to discuss the country's future. We're delighted to be joined by an extraordinary panel. Aung San Suu Kyi, democracy icon, former prisoner, Nobel laureate, member of parliament, chairman of the National League for Democracy, the main opposition party in the country. Uso Tain. Union Minister in overall charge of economic affairs. He is described as the driving figure for reforms. He was Commander-in-Chief of the Navy. He now serves in President Tencent's office and is described as probably the closest minister to the President's thinking. Zinma Ong is a former prisoner. She spent 11 years in jail for distributing political statements, nine of those years in solitary confinement. U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton named her International Woman of Courage last year as one of those watering the seeds of democracy. She remains an activist and co-founded the Yangon School of Political Science. Ladies and gentlemen, our World Debate panel. First, though, let me turn to Minister Sotain. Thank you for joining us here today. It's the first time the BBC uh, can hold a television debate in your country. This would have been unthinkable two years ago when an authoritarian military regime decided to change itself from within. Is this irreversible? Sir, so, you know that last two years ago, there's changes, historic changes, is almost unimaginable. So, Myanmar, now we rebuild Myanmar as a new Myanmar that is democratic or inclusive, dynamic, developed nation. Then we try to stand back our position. Those days we are the failed state. Now we move the active, responsible memberships of the international community. Another thing is what my respectable uh, elder sister said last 20 years back freedom from fear. Now we are freedom of expression, freedom of association. And uh, another thing is freedom of media. So that is irreversible. Aung San Suu Kyi, is it irreversible in your view? I would like you to ask a different sort of question, whether or not about whether or not this process is irreversible, but whether certain mindsets are reversible. Whether or not this process is irreversible will depend on the reversibility of certain mindsets on both sides of the divide. Because what we need most of all is national reconciliation and commitment on, on the part of the great majority <coughs> of our people to go forward with this process. So it really depends on our commitment and determination. So it depends on the reversibility of mindsets, which is not an easy thing to do. But I believe that we can do it if we are committed enough. Zin Maung, uh, is it irreversible? Do you and your students feel politically liberated and with no fear, or could you find yourself back under arrest one day? Is that something you still fear? Uh, I don't feel like that currently, but uh, regarding to your questions, uh, if, if is it reversible or not? Uh, that is my also concern. Is it reversible, but if it's uh, turn around the cycle or um, you know, we are going forward, that is my concern. 
Fongzo, you went into exile in 1988 and returned only last year. You're founder and editor of the Irrawaddy magazine. What's your view? I would like to say that this current reform is a process. And uh, whether this will benefit ordinary people is remain to be seen. And some people I spoke to here, they told me that this reform process is stalled. And they're afraid that it will be sabotaged or undermined by some dark elements in the country. And more importantly, let me stress that the power and the wealth are still managed by the same people who have brutally governed the country for the last decades. Well, let me put that immediately uh, to Minister Soten. That that's kind of issue is you have to expect these, this kind of challenges. There will be other people that want to reform. They like democracy. Other people sitting on the fence. Other people, they very accustomed to happy with the old, old regime. So that's, we have to expect that. We need to broaden the reformists. That's oh. we will win. Aung San Suu Kyi, the danger of sabotage, dark elements at work, trust. I like the word trust. I'm not sure I like uh, dark elements. It's a little melodramatic for me. Uh, but do you fear I, I those kind of elements? I think that in politics, not? you really have to keep your feet firmly on the ground. Of course, there's always a possibility of reversal. I said this earlier, that there's no such thing as an irreversible uh, position. It depends very much on the commitment of our people. And that comes down to inclusiveness, which is uh, something that we've been talking about a lot in this forum. If the people feel that they are included in this reform process, then it will not be reversible. Or at least, let me put it this way, that it will not be easily reversible. But if there are too many people who feel excluded, then the dangers of, rever of the, a reversal of the situation would be very great. Let me go to Ukoko, uh, who's chairman of Yangon Media Group, uh, publishing two weekly papers, the Flower News and the Yangon Times. Is reform yet reaching uh, far and wide across the country, do you believe or not? Yes. Uh, many people are still arguing that uh, Myanmar reform process still not reaching to the bottom. I don't know what is the cause of that. Because of the, they refer to the daily life of the peoples. Why does happen? Corruptions, mindsets, Capacity issues or rule of law? I would like to know. Ong Zhou, as an editor, what restrictions are you still facing, particularly from the ministries? Well, I think uh, since we're sitting here with the BBC World Debate, I think I would say that uh, the press here is much freer. But at the same time, my question is to uh, Minister Wu Sotein and also Don San Suchi, is that uh, whether one day in this long process, whether Ministry of Information is really needed. Minister, you are still controlling the press. They cannot publish what they want to, including about generals. No, I don't think so. Freedom of you know, press and freedom of media is now better and better. You have to consider about that the other side is the Americans. You have to compare with the American way. Then you have to compare with the nearby countries like Singapore and Thailand and Vietnam. So maybe the balance. And you have to do step by step. We need the what kind of things, uh, what the mindset and capacity for everybody. That's the problem in Myanmar. You have a lot of capacity because you have experience such kind of things abroad. But we have to think about the holistic view for the media openness. What do you mean by holistic view? Because yes. there's a population out there, 60 million yeah. people, who want to know what's happening in your country. Yes, you have, you, you, now you can use a private newspaper and something like that. You have to compare with the yesterday problems, now better than last year, two years back. So better and better, I think so. Aung San Suu Kyi, you're now in Parliament. What needs to be done to improve freedom of the press still? Of course, laws are important with regard to the protection of all freedoms, not just freedom of the press. But I would like to respond to Kwanzaa's comments because there are two parts to it. One is that is there necessity for a Ministry of Information? And the second one is, is there sufficient freedom of the press? It depends on what you mean by sufficient. We certainly do not have perfect freedom of the press. And I think there, there is too much fear. There is too much fear of openness. And I don't think 
we should fear openness. We should be able to face openness. That is a sign of maturity in a democratic society. And secondly, with regard to the need for a Ministry of Information, Information in itself, there's nothing wrong with it. What we don't want is a ministry of censorship. A ministry of information is all right, particularly if it helps to take information out to our 60 million better. Zinma, you were arrested and held in jail for 11 years for distributing leaflets. Do you feel you can act freely now? Yeah, compared with last uh, 15 years ago, is a little bit freer and getting more media free. A little bit freer. Little bit, yeah. <laughs> do, you, do you therefore constrain yourself in what you write? Do you hold back in what you write still? Uh, yeah, currently as I think about, um, people in here, non-public, you know, uh, by the ex-political prisoners who uh, wrote the novels or poems, now they are publishing. In, in this extent, yeah, we are uh, getting a little bit yeah, you know, but uh, let me just pick up on one point, this fear of openness we've just heard from Aung San Suu Kyi. Do you fear openness, Minister? No, no, no. It's one day you have to be. I already mentioned about my elder sister said 20 years back, freedom from fear. That is, we have to move. So people should read this book again. <laughs> so I, 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 I don't like, afraid that. I would quite like the government to yes. publish it for me. Yes, yes, <laughs> right. <laughs> Let's move on to a very critical issue about the role of the military in a new democracy. We've had a tweet from Yahan Kadar in uh, Binor in India. If you believe in democracy, then you have to remove uh, the military, you in other words. Uh, Minister Soten, the military of 350,000 has dominated every aspect of public life in Burma for 50 years. Is it really ready? Is it really ready to release its undemocratic stranglehold in Parliament that means it can still block reforms and changes? What you said is the absolutely correct. But the conditions last uh, about uh, 20 years back, everything is done doing by the military people. They thought that they can do uh, everything. So now change democratic government. The way you have to abrupt change is not good for the country. So gradually change what you have said. Gradually, my point of view is gradually change. And but how know, gradually? How, how rapidly? How gradually? How slowly? It depends on the parliament speaker. <laughs> yeah, our guest. Uh, I think... Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I look upon this as an evasion of responsibility. <laughs> now, I do not believe in evasion of responsibility. <laughs> but you were seen uh, at Armed Forces Day very openly sitting alongside the, the chiefs of staff uh, within the military, Aung San Suu Kyi. What's your view about the future role? Because the president has said they will still have a special place in the future of the country. I want the military to have a special place in the hearts of our people. And that is to say, I want a military that is professional and that is honorable and that is there to defend our nation and our, and our people. And this is the kind of army my father anticipated when he founded it back in the early 1940s. Can it be changed after of what's Of course. Happened? I believe that change is always possible, to find, uh, provided we are serious about it and we are sincere about it. And I do believe that the great majority of our soldiers love our country. Uh, but like the rest of us, I don't think patriotism is a reserve of any particular organization or any sector of the public. I think it belongs to all of us. And we all just have to agree on what the role of each institution within a democratic society is. What do you say to those close to you who are worried about that position, like Wintin, the co-founder of the National League for Democracy, who says that you, can, you think you can persuade all the military leaders to become your friends and come to your side? I don't think I can persuade all the military leaders. I think I can't even persuade all the democracy leaders to come to my side. <laughs> so I think to, to think of persuading all the military leaders would, yes. leaders would be a little bit too much like wishful thinking. But uh, I think that not I, but the majority of our people can persuade 
our military re leaders that we should all work together for the good of our nation. And that would require an honorable professional army that has a true place in the hearts of our people. There are high expectations uh, that uh, the military framed uh, constitution will be changed as the next stage of democratization. So let's move on with that to Serge Pun. You are a major entrepreneur. You started from nothing. You now run your own company. You have 30 companies uh, across eight industries. But here are you worried about the constitution. I think the constitution as it stands today it's a vast improvement of what it was before. But if you say, do we need improvement? Do we need amendments? I think we definitely do. And uh, the issue of 25% of the legislature being occupied um, without, without election is that democratic, it's a very hot topic of debate. And that is my question to Dosu. What do you think are the chances for the parliament to amend the constitution in order to pave the way for you to be president? That is not the only part of the constitution that needs to be amended. I think there are many other aspects of the constitution which should be a worry to those who believe in democracy. But I will also have to make the point that this constitution is said by experts to be the most difficult constitution in the world to amend. So we must start by amending the requirements for amendments. <laughs> we have first got yes, to make yes, the constitution right, yeah. amendable. And then we start thinking of which parts of the constitution we are going to amend. And of course, there's a debate about whether we go uh, piecemeal or whether we go for the whole thing. We just renegotiate the whole constitutional process. But first of all, it's got to be made amendable. At the moment, you require more than 75% to amend the major, the most serious parts of the constitution. And I always say, apart from the fact that, of course, uh, uh, 75% of the seats are not really filled by civilians because there are some uh, constituencies where there have been no elections. So even if we had a f the full quarter of 75% civilians, I always make the point that we would need at least one brave soldier to stand with us. <laughs> and then we can amend the constitution. And then we have to go for a referendum. Excuse me, I want to add on what um, my elder sister said. So the constitution is doing by the human being. So you can amend by the human being. This is not a permanent one. That's what we said. Another thing is the, for the democratic point of view and for, for the all inclusive point of view, you have to measure the constitutions. That's piece by piece. You have to, the justice should be the democratic and all inclusive. And that is the main point. Jinma. Yeah, I would like to uh, ask the, regarding to the 25%. Um, you know, according to, to the amend the constitution, um, actually in democracy, majority uh, rules and minority rights. In this regard, you know, 25% is um, more important than 75%. What does that mean is 25% is getting veto to amend the Constitution. That that is, I think, the, the trap for us to amend how to amend the constitutions or people power or sending some other social. We still need some other social movement or something like that. And that's not the end of the story. There has to be yeah. a referendum afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> you have, you are having a very active debate both within your party and other parties about the future of the constitution and the changes needed. But Serge Pan has a very important question, which is backed by a lot of social media. Aung San Suu Kyi. Let me read Vikram Jain from India. Burma's future will be bright in the hands of democratic leader Aung San Suu Kyi. Roger Haddad, a member of the Swedish Parliament, will she run for president in 2015? Everyone's asking the question. You give us your answer. <laughs> well, I want to run for president, and I'm quite frank about it, although I was told by a BBC uh, interviewer that she'd never come across a politician who'd ever admitted to wanting to run for the presidency. But you just said you do. Yes, I do. Because uh, le let's be open about it. There are those who say that I shouldn't say I would like to be president, but then 
um, if I didn't, if I pretended that I didn't want to be president, I wouldn't be honest, and I would rather be honest with my people than otherwise. But in order for me to run for the presidency, you don't really run for the presidency because it's not a, the presidents are not directly elected. But for me to be eligible for the post of the presidency, the constitution will have to be amended. Right, let's move on to another issue. The massive challenge now is reconciliation with both political activists and ethnic minorities. Let me give you a, a sample of this. Uh, Adrian Enriques from Jamaica. President Tencent is making some really positive reforms that has implications for a good economic and political future for Burma, but ethnic and social problems are a setback. Let's get a, a sense of the feelings here. We are joined by a monk, U Isaria. Welcome, you're a monk from Rangoon, you're a leader of the Saffron Revolution in 2007. You were sentenced to 22 years for inciting riots and tarnishing the image of the state, and you served four and a half years in prison. What's your view about this critical issue? I believe that in the reconciliation process, where the adibates and minorities, trust building is vital. I strongly believe that if we could implement the same no one above the law, the mutual respect and trust will be irrefutable so that the state must ensure the independence and impartiality of the justice system. May I know whether this will be implemented? You're saying no one is above the law and you want independence and impartiality of the justice system. A concern then from a very uh, significant part of the community. Uso Tain. We plan to do step by step, and I think maybe the end of the year, genuine people, genuine political prisoner will be released. But no one above the law, that's what we're hearing yes, from but Uwe Isaria. Uh, other things, uh, the for, former government is doing such kind of things, what the CRO said. Now we did in the transparent way, and. Judicial is independent. <laughs> no, it is not independent. <laughs> the judiciary is not independent. The judiciary is very much under the control of the executive. To begin yeah. with, it's the president who appoints the chief of uh, the chief justice and uh, the justices in the regional uh, regions as well. So. What we have to do in order to establish rule of law in this country, which is absolutely necessary if we are to go forward with the reform process, because that's a key ingredient of inclusiveness. If people feel that they're all partaking of the protection of the law, that's a first step towards a, a perception of inclusiveness. And in order to have rule of law, we need a free and independent judiciary. And I must... Uh, I must disagree with Uso Thing, and since I'm his elder sister, he's got to listen to me. <laughs> the judiciary is Sorry. not Sorry. independent. It's, it's, it's according to the constitution. Oh. When you have to amend the constitution, it's okay. <laughs> then another thing is the, we have to strengthen the rules of law. We're joined by Salil Shetty, who's Secretary General of uh, Amnesty International. What assessment are you making from outside of the state of law and human rights here? If we're talking about rule of law, we're talking about accountability for ongoing violations and past violations. Uh, how do we make sure that there is an end to impunity in this country? Let me add that we've had a lot of uh, tweets uh, and Facebook on this. Here's one from Billy Mayaya, a human rights activist from Malawi, who says right now the government of Myanmar is releasing syrupy rhetoric, but is it ready to account for the atrocities of the past? Jinma. Do you want revenge? Do you want accountability for those who've done whatever they've done here in recent years? As a political prisoner, I personally, um, you know, I um, do not have any sense of revenge. Um, but the thing is, justice is really important. What we would like to um, show for the next generation, what was really happening in the past is our history. So that is, uh, you know, when, uh, what I would like to um, highlight and promote for our next generation. Where could this now go? Uh, in South Africa, they've had the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Is that something, Aung San Suu Kyi, you believe should be happening here? I don't think of it in terms of a commission, but I think that there are very strong links between truth and reconciliation. I do not think 
that accountability is the reverse side of revenge. No, it does not mean that because you want people to be accountable, you want to take revenge on them. But I think there has to be an acknowledgement of our past. Unless we are able to pay, face our past freely, we will not be able to proceed freely towards the future. But I, for one, am entirely against the whole concept of revenge. But accountability is related to courage. And I like courage. I admire courage in individuals as well as in organizations and, as, uh, and in, uh, in nations. And I would like us to have the courage to be able to face our past squarely that the same mistakes may not be repeated in the future, but making it quite clear that I personally am not for trying anybody or punishing them or seeking revenge or uh, taking the kind of action that will destroy people for what they had done in the past. Well, so because I believe in accountability, but also I believe in people's right to redeem themselves. Well, so Tain, it's important to underline you were nodding agreement there about looking and examining the past. So you have to think about the right blend for the understanding of the past and appreciation of the evolving or present dynamic. That is, should be the sometimes you have to think about that. What you have said is absolutely correct, but we need time. We are in the dark age or the other system about 60 years, not 60 months, not six years. 60 years is six zero. It's, you know, too long. Now two years, we have to, we have idea to arrange for the, you know, everything we have to change, but we need time because we have to, we need time for lose the Titan the, the rope, about 60 years. So you have to untie the rope. It is sometimes very difficult for me. Burma's new name is the Union of Myanmar. And uh, a major ongoing threat to the stability and future economic prospects of this nation comes from various armed rebel groups and ethnic minorities challenging that union. A key challenge is from 800,000 Rohingya Muslims who are stateless. The UN labels them one of the most persecuted minorities in the world. Well, Abul Tahay is chair of the Union National Development Party, a largely ethnic Rohingya party. We asked that he come to this debate, but he couldn't get access. Uh, so I went to his office in Yangon, where he recorded this question for this debate. Rohingya as well as Muslim communities have been denied full flush citizenship since 1982 citizenship law comes into operations which contravenes universal declarations of human rights. My question is, shouldn't it change by leaders with retrospective effect? And isn't it an obligation of leaders to protect minorities from the influence of majorities to promote rights and integrations. Thank you. Minister, the obligation of governments to protect minorities like the Rohingya. So we have to protect the people's security. Now on a day before that we are thinking about national security, including that we, we give more uh, focus and more share to the the trend has changed to people's security. That is, the, what I mean is the community security, you know, human rights security, then political security, personal security, health security, environmental security, economic security, food security, such like that. In future, we have to do, we have to protect the whole, those who stay in our territory. That's our duty. But that human rights monitor. In the here. Human rights monitors yes. are claiming that the army is condoning and even participating against the nation's Muslim minority. No, we, that is a very complicated thing. We have to discuss it all just like the commission and something like that. Well, let's get a reflection on this. If we can go to uh, Chant Mint U, who's a historian, about how important this ethnic minority issue is for the future of Myanmar. It's critical. I mean, in one way, this has been an issue that's been with the country since independence or even before independence. Myanmar was a multi-ethnic, multicultural country before British times. In British times, the colonial power 
rule different parts of the country differently. There were lots of immigrants who had come from India over the 50, 100 years of colonial rule. And so this question of what is it to be Burmese or to be Myanmar has been a central question throughout our politics since 1948. The civil war, the armed conflicts began in 1948-49, partly on issues of identity, partly on issues of nationalism. We are now at the end of, we hope, of 70 years of armed conflict in this country. And I think everyone accepts that there is no way forward, there's no way towards democracy, there's no way towards economic development until the armed conflicts are resolved. But around that is a much broader issue of what does it mean to be Myanmar? Uh, how can we forge a more inclusive national identity? It's not just about the Myanmar Burmese majority and different ethnic minorities. We have millions of uh, Myanmar people in Thailand. Are the children born there Myanmar or not? We have immigrants, Chinese immigrants, for instance, from, from, from China who've come in over the last 10 years. Are there children who were born here in Myanmar or not? I mean, there's a much broader issue of inclusiveness and identity that's central, I think, to the politics of this country. Abu Tahay uh, has met President Obama and British Prime Minister in Rangoon, David Cameron, that is, but not yet Aung San Suu Kyi. So he had this question for you, mentioning that you're the daughter of General Aung San, the country's independence hero. For Aung San Suu Kyi, I have three key points to highlight. The first one is Rohingya issues as were well, resolved by our national hero, General Aung San. Aung San Suu Kyi is daughter of General Aung San. Second point, Aung San Suu Kyi is internationalist, recognized democratic icon. And Aung San Suu Kyi also Nobel Peace Literate. That is why Dong San Suu Kyi has obligation to come up with concrete common grounds to resolve the Rohingya issues for the sake of nations and people of this country. Aung San Suu Kyi, real expectation on you particularly uh, to resolve this issue of citizenship for a minority like the Rohingyas? Well, at the moment, nobody seems to be very satisfied with me because I'm not taking sides. Uh, but uh, let's look at it this way. I believe in rule of law. I think that the first necessity is rule of law. In the Rakhine, until people feel safe, until people can be sure that they will not be killed in bed or their houses burned above them, they're not going to talk to each other and there is, no going to be gen there is not going to be any kind of genuine reconciliation. So because I believe in rule of law, first of all, I believe that everybody must be entitled to security under the present administration and that the administration must do everything possible to ensure the security of all peoples in our country whatever their race whatever their religion and secondly when I say rule of law, it also means the law with regard to citizenship and that I look at it in two steps. First of all, are all those who are entitled to citizenship under the 1982 law now citizens? Have they been given citizenship in accordance with the 1982 law? That is the first thing we have to look at. And then secondly, we must reassess the 1982 law to see if it is in line with international norms. That is what rule of law means, and it's not an exciting answer that I'm giving you. And people don't like it because they prefer the sort of things that they can flash in the headlines. Well, pra pragmatism is clearly a uh, way ahead, but what is fascinating is the number of people who've contacted us in advance like uh, Yusra ben Trif from Magnus in Morocco, how can a Peace Nobel Prize winner uh, stand silent when an ethnic cleansing is going on in your own country? Patrick Pitts, based in the UK, why is Aung San Suu Kyi silent about the massacre? I have of, not of been silent. I, I'm merely asking the questions uh, which others are putting. People who are now very aware of what is happening with the ethnic minorities in your country? Well, first of all, as I said, I have not been silent. It's just that they're not hearing what they want to hear from me. But I cannot doctor my answers to please everybody. I have to say what I believe in. And I believe that rule of law is the first step towards any kind of solution to the problem in the Rakhine state and other parts of this country. And of course, that's not an exciting answer. So people would rather think that I was not saying anything than that I was saying something so boring that they'd rather not hear. But it is a practical need. And as I said, then we must go get to the point of reassessing the law to see if 
it comes up to international norms or not. And I would like people all over the world to understand that we are aware of the difficulties in our country and we are doing our best to cope with it. When I say we, I'm not talking about the government. I'm talking about ordinary people in Burma because Burma is made up of different races and different uh, religions. And uh, I, I really must take up this question of Burma, Myanmar, which you mentioned just now. It reminds me very much of a line by, I think, Paul Collier in his book, that it's, easy to, it's easier to rename a country than to change it. As you know, Burma was renamed Myanmar sometime under, this, uh, in, under the previous military regime. 19, what, 19, 91, 92? Well, suddenly one day they decided that they were going to change the name of the country. Now, the reason why I stick to the, uh, to the name Burma is because the country was not changed uh, in accordance with the will of the people. The people had nothing to do with it. And also, I think that there was something intrinsically dishonest about the change in name. The, the, the implication that Myanmar refers to all the ethnic nationalities of Burma, which it does not. Myanmar is simply a literary form of Bama, which means just the Burmese ethnic group. So I would want to make this quite clear, because if we are going to resolve our problems, we've got to face them squarely. It's not going to make them go away simply by putting a different name onto it. And it's the same thing with the problem of our Muslims in Burma. It's a big problem, it's a complicated problem, particularly because uh, Islam has spread worldwide and there are Islamic links everywhere, and anything that happens everywhere in the world is known immediately. Zinma, um, when you hear that, what's your view? Because 40% of your country's population is uh, an ethnic minority one way or the other. How do you get reconciliation? Do you have optimism that there are 13 agreements now, at least ceasefires in place? A 14th agreement was put in place last week. Is that showing a determination to at least address these issues now? Regarding to the reconciliation, we, most all the, um, the ethnics, including the bombers are uh, re, uh, socialized by the, the past regime. So uh, it, uh, I think that it takes time. So that's why in the past, uh, when the, the fight between the KIA and the Burmese military fight, uh, we visited. I have been there for four times to the ITB camps. I just want to explain then the fighting is just between the Burmese military, uh, government military, and the KIA, not fighting between the Burmese people and the Kachin people. That is, uh, I always would like to raise uh, the uh, the sense of the fightings and the between the ethnic peoples and Burmese uh, majority. Well, as we heard from Utan Min there, this is so critical for the future of your country. Um, and what I'd like to ask you, Usatain, based on one of the tweets we've had uh, from Taswin Ayungiji, I hope that's pronounced correctly, from Burma, the co-founder of the World with Conscience, is federalism potentially the solution for the ethnic conflict? Sure, what you have said is uh, absolutely correct. What we are going on is uh, after the ceasefire or ceasefire agree some agreement, what you have said, then we are uh, now doing on the uh, framework for political dialogue. Then we start doing the political dialogue all inclusive as a meeting, huge meeting. Then we are thinking about the, what you said about the federalism. That is a sharing of power, sharing of resource. Just like, for example, in Germany is doing such kind of federalism. Federalism is not the, you know, those days, 1962, the people are afraid of federalism as a cause. Federalism means other, other definition. Now federalism is not like definition. It's a power sharing and resource sharing and equality for the nation and races people. One of the critical reasons for addressing the ethnic minorities and the activists, of course, is the economy. Because people want to invest here, but they want to know it's a stable country. And Myanmar has the lowest output per person in Southeast Asia. President Ten Sen said publicly, there are still too many people whose life is a battle against poverty. It's a hand-to-mouth existence. But one new analysis says Myanmar has major advantages which could generate in 15 years economic wealth four times what it is today. Let's go to Stephen Groff, who's a vice president of the Asia Development Bank, um, where 
you're analyzing week by week both the issues in Myanmar and also the potential. We have questions around uh, issues around inclusiveness and how inclusive growth will be in the future. I think we heard, we heard questions earlier about you know, the reforms not being people, poor people not yet benefiting from this reform process. So it, again, when we think about economic development, when we think about investment, we need to be thinking about economic development investment that's going to benefit the 70% of the country that lives you know, in, in quite dire straits. And so I think that this is going to be the critical question and this is going to be the critical challenge of the, of the country moving forward. We are the rich resource country, everybody knows that. For the transparent and accountable, we just, uh, as a candidate of the EITI members, that is the Extractive Industry Transparency Initiatives. Uh, after that kind of things, we are the member of that kind of the association. Uh, that will be transparent. That is the government and company and the civil society. You can check how much revenue we have. Then all transparent and all the ethnic people, they understand how much revenue you are, you, uh, the country get for that uh, issue. And another thing is the, uh, what I already mentioned about the resource sharing. So that's, that's at the time, everybody can <clears throat> you know, get the benefit from the resource. On San Suu Kyi, this issue of inclusiveness, how much do you fear that this will not happen, not least because of the level of cronyism? And that's a, an extraordinary word I keep hearing being repeated here. Cronies, those who are too close to the military and the former governments who've made their money but not benefited the people at the bottom. I think you have to be a little careful about that because some people who made a lot of money uh, over the last two decades are, are now supporting many humanitarian activities. And I've accepted their donations in order to help humani humanitarian causes. I have no uh, compunctions about that because I think it's better that they should that you use their money in that way rather than, uh, for example, buying another private jet or something like that. But uh, with regard to inclusiveness, uh, for our society to be really inclusive, we have to look to our rural community because almost 70% of our people live in the rural areas and uh, their living depends on agriculture. So if we want to be, if we want our process to be inclusive, it means that there must be a greater share for everybody in the economic growth and development that we expect. and. Uh, I have been making the point over the last um, few months because since we entered two th 2013 that we're now entering the third year of reform and all right good intentions are very well but what we now want to do, do to see our results in the way of a real change in the lives of our people and if you talk to the man on the street if you talk to uh, people in a village a woman in a village the great majority of them would say that their lives have not changed in any way since 2010 one thing is that you know to to amend the Constitution and the second thing is developed and the um, the um, to develop the mechanism for the rule of law. And the third one is the uh, infrastructure. And the last one is that for, I would like to focus on the young people. According to the uh, uh, Asia Development uh, Bank report, the, um, there's 18% uh, of the young people, the age between 13 and 18, who are the 40% of workforce. So in here in Burma, there is a no more opportunity and get to get the decent employment, to get a proper training, to get a uh, proper jobs for the young people. That they are, I think the current government has lack of mechanism to create jobs for the young people. Tadmid, who as the historian, when you look at the legacy that's now left by the military uh, control of this country and what those particularly in the country expect, What's your analysis? I mean, there are questions of political will. There are questions of institutional capacity. There's the questions of mentalities that have been created over 60 years of military rule, 60 years of isolation from, from the outside world. I mean, we have to appreciate that what is going on here is something quite unique. 
I mean, I think we all hope that we're at the beginning of a lasting political transition towards more democratic government. We hope that we're moving from the old type of state-centered economy to one that is more based on freer markets. And we all hope that we can put the armed conflicts behind this, uh, behind us. But this is all happening at a time when the country is also being de-isolated from the, for, for the first time in decades. I think any country would have difficulty in making this kind of transformation. But if you put into the equation as well, these legacies of military rule, the legacies of the way in which the education system has been systematically underfunded, dismantled over decades. I mean, these are, this is a very unique challenge. Aung San Suu Kyi, the final word uh, in this debate to you uh, from the panel, because you have pushed so long and hard on the issue of skills in education. Can the need be matched in this country or not? Yes, because we will have to do it. We don't have a choice. If we do not match the need, then we will not be able to stay the course. So it's not a matter of whether it can be matched or not. It will have to be matched. Can it be done? Yes. Provided, of course, it amend the Constitution. Yeah. <laughs> and with you as president? Yes. <laughs> As I bring this debate to a close, can I just uh, turn to Yun Mon Han? You're, you've come back to this country. You are trying to help people who are looking for a future. How do you feel about the debate we've had here? Does it give you optimism? I am cautiously optimistic about the future. Um, I have seen many changes before me, and they've been positive. And from a systemic level, I do believe we are on the forward path to democracy. It may not be perfect. Um, but there are other countries who have been struggling with the issue of democracy for 200, 300 years, and it's still not a perfect system. So we do need to be patient with the process. And something that I would like to encourage the change makers in this room is to actually give a greater communication channel to the people, um, because they also need to be guided and encouraged to speak out on issues that are important to them. And right now, this is the freest we've been in 60 years. And some of the agenda items we have, you know, from the bottom up, it's cheap SIM cards, it's Korean soap operas, it's, you know, ethnic violence. And I really think we need to start working with the government hand in hand to create a better future for our next generation, uh, young people like myself. Well, can I thank all our panel here in Ecuador? To Minister Usatain, thank you very much indeed. Aung San Suu Kyi and, of course, uh, Zinma as well. Thank you for joining us here, being so frank and confirming you'd like to be president one day, Aung San Suu Kyi. You've heard it first here. Um, from all of us here, this is for our audience at the BBC on television, on radio and online. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. From me, Nick Gowing, here in Ecuador. bye-bye. <laughs>